Greetings everyone and welcome back to the bench. It's time to kick off the JAT or John Audio Tech Easy Amplifier Project. Kind of a re-kick off because I did kind of announce this thing back in October but I never really got started on it. I apologize for not having a lot of videos up lately. I've been busy with work but I have been working in the background and I got the amplifier designed. I even have a prototype board set up and uh, actually powered up for the first time in this video. Okay, so what is the JAT Easy Amplifier Project? Well, it's a simplified amplifier. It's not going to be extremely complex. It'll have seven transistors with a monolithic Darlington type output which helps cut down on components. With this amplifier I'm not going for the highest wattage or super low distortion or anything like that. I just want a simple circuit that people might want to be interested in building. I just want to do my part to help keep this hobby alive. This hobby isn't like it was decades ago back in the 80s or 70s or even earlier. So that's one reason for doing this thing. You know, you could go out and buy a chip amp or something easy to build. But, you know, this takes a little more effort. But it's not as complex as the other amplifier I did that had 13 transistors. So the idea is to keep the cost down and make it a simpler circuit. Like I said, I'm going to use Darlington output transistors in these TO220 cases. And they're very inexpensive. They're only like 90 some cents a piece. Whereas in the other amplifier, I'm using those larger transistors, the 2SC5200 and its complement. Plus it'll need drivers and some other components. So you would have to spend seven or eight dollars just on the output stage of the other amplifier. Whereas this circuit using these, you know, less than two dollars. So doing this keeps the cost down. Though these Darlington transistors do have their drawbacks, I know some designers don't like using them. However, they have been used in consumer amplifiers before, and they work just fine. Now, one thing I would like to mention in the last video with the JAT501 amp, I went through a whole series of videos. I, you know, I spread it out over a long time. It took a year and a half before I got the amplifier finished. But I wanted to go through each stage of the amplifier and kind of discuss how the stage works. And I ran into problems and went through how to fix them. You know, I had the oscillation and things like that. And little tweaks and everything to get the amplifier to its final state. Well, with future videos, since I've been through all that, there's no need to rehash all that content again. So I'm going to build these amplifiers within one to maybe three videos. Okay, so to go through this again, it's the JAT Easy Amp project, shooting for around 35 watts into 8 ohms or 50 watts into 4 ohms. And if you're sure you're not going to run the amp with 4 ohm loads, you can boost the power supply voltages up a little bit and maybe get 40 or 50 watts at 8 ohms. But I'm basing the design on a plus and minus 28 volt supply, maybe 30 volts. And you kind of have to design these amplifiers based on the transformers that are available. As far as distortion I'm shooting for, it'll be around 0 0.01, give or take, at 1 kilohertz. And that would be around 0 0.1 at 20 kilohertz. Like I said, I'm using a low-cost Darlington, monolithic Darlington output stage using these transistors or happy little transistor guy down there. So what are the benefits of using a monolithic Darlington transistor for the output stage? Well, it contains the driver and the outputs, of course. So those are kind of integrated together. They contain the speed-up resistors. They even have a reverse bias protection diode across the collector and emitter. The TO220 case is very inexpensive. However, that does bring some limitations. 
These don't dissipate as much current as the larger packages like the TO264, which would be used in the JAT501 amp. So that's one reason I can't go with too high of output power. These actually have a little less gain than a discrete output stage. I have to run the voltage amplification stage at a little bit higher current to make up for that. And that might prevent me from getting the lower distortion figures. This is the preliminary schematic for the circuit. Don't build anything with this yet because it's not finalized, it's not tested. But if we compare it to the uh, JAT501 amp, you know, this is a lot more complex than this one. For one thing, there's no current mirror circuit here. I am degenerating the emitters here with 100 ohm resistors. I want a little bit of degeneration going on there. I'm using a bootstrap circuit instead of a constant current source. The bootstrap circuit kind of acts as a constant current source. But if you look at the cost components, it's, you know, it's really a toss-up which way to go with that. And again, just using the uh, Darlington output transistor so there's no drivers and the external speed-up resistor I used in the other circuit. If I bring that back in here, you can see all of this stuff is reduced down to these transistors here. So yeah, it's a much simpler circuit. Like I say, the idea is to keep the cost down, make it something people might want to build, yet be a useful amplifier. And here is the prototype on perf board. So one thing I did is to make sure that the supply bypass capacitors are close to the output transistors. If you remember from the last amp, I had that oscillation and I had to set up some capacitors close to the output. I still had to run some grounds over, but you may not show up, but you can see the ceramic caps I'm using on the supply bypass there are close to the outputs. And there's no big long ground traces. It's right there. This is the little ground circuit. So all the grounds star off and go their own direction. The supplies go off into their own directions for different parts of the circuit. So yeah, I hope it's a lot stabler. But, you know, I haven't powered this up yet. We will certainly uh, do that and hope it works. I did leave off the uh, low pass filter circuit, part of the low pass, which is this capacitor right here, because I need that out of the circuit to run the high frequency test and the uh, step response tests. But yeah, you can see this is a, a lot less complex than the 501, if I grab that. See, this has quite a bit more to it than the other circuit. I'll need to get the heat spreader mounted to this and all that, put on a heat sink before I run the tests. But right now, uh, I'll just power it up at low voltage and low current, see how this works. That's one thing people should do when they get an amplifier. Always got these in the comment sections where a person bought one of those Class D boards off eBay. They hooked it up and it blew up. I've never had one of those just blow up. They've all worked. So I have to assume that they hooked something up wrong. But if you limited your current when you're testing the amplifier by using a current limited supply or you know adding something in to limit the current, you could have saved the circuit. But in my case, I just set up this power supply here to uh, limit current so I can uh, do some preliminary power-up tests to make sure this thing's going to work. Okay, without further ado, let's get this thing hooked up to the supply. Okay, I hooked up the power supply. Got the filter caps there. Running it at a low voltage and 
limited power supply current at 100 milliamps. So let's turn this on. It's drawing 20 milliamps. So that's good. Nothing's shorted. No uh, backwards electrolytics because that would certainly draw more current. I almost forgot to plug in the Miller compensation cap, but I got that connected. So let me adjust the bias here. See if that has any effect. Go the other way. Oh, there we go. Okay, that went into current limit. So at least that's doing something. But I'll keep the uh, bias turned down for now since I don't have it on a heat sink. These are slightly warm. When I touch the input, I'm not getting any hum. I have a speaker connected. So that's not a good sign. I don't think the amplifier is working. So I'm going to have to probe around, see what the problem is. If you remember from the 501 video project where uh, I had missing traces and open connection, that amp didn't work either. So let me probe around with the meter here and see what the problem is. Oh, thanks to KISS Analog. He's the one who sent me this Tektronix DM916. And uh, check my PO box, and he sent in the, the missing insert to the socket here. So now I can use this DMM. Well, I've been probing around the circuit and checking voltages and currents and things. Everything seems kosher. I'm just not getting any signal through it. If I touch this input line it should hum but you see it doesn't do anything. One thing to keep in mind when you build these circuits and test them at idle with this design and most amplifier designs all these transistors will be turned on with a bias current flowing through them. So if you probe with your meter from the base to collector you should see a voltage about 0.6 volts or so on every transistor. Of course, these being Darlingtons, they'll have a higher voltage, around 1.2 or so. But when I check these, everything, all these uh, transistors are looking good. So I noticed one thing. I grab a meter lead here. When I touch this input, I don't know if you can hear that. But I'm getting signal through there. Let me touch it with a screwdriver. Power supply doesn't like that. It goes into protect because I have the current limit set so low. But, you know, I touch the input. There's nothing. So something uh, is not connected on the input. Okay, found the problem. Another John Audio Tech soldering error. See, this is connected. But right here, this resistor, which is this 1K resistor, that's in series with the input cap. This lead, you probably can't see it, is not soldered. See, that's open. That's the base of the input transistor. Differential pair on one side. Open. This is the other side. Dead. Capacitor dead. So I'll warm up my soldering iron and solder this connection in and it should work. Okay, so I warmed up the soldering iron and fixed that connection. And, oh, gotta turn the power on. Here we go. Well, 
we got us a working amplifier. So what I'll do now, I'll give a little sample of music through it to see what it sounds like. So what I think I'll do is take my music player and run it into this mono mix down box. I made this thing like 27 years ago. So as I say, it takes the stereo signal and mix it to mono for testing these little amplifiers. So I can control if I want to hear the right or the left channel or both. I can sum the signal together, which would be a normal mono mix down. Or I can differentiate the signal. And what that does is remove all the center pan vocals and uh, instruments. Of course, that depends on how the stereo mix was done. Why would you want to do that? Well, it's kind of neat. You can hear how the song is constructed with other instruments because sometimes the vocals and uh, monopanned instruments cover up the other instruments. And if you're a musician, it allows you to hear those instruments. I'm not really a musician, but uh, it's kind of neat to hear that. So that's why I have the differentiation mode there. Okay, I have it hooked up. Keep in mind I have the bias turned down because without a heat sink, the sensing transistor is not thermally in contact with these and it can't track it. So this thing wants to thermally run away. So yeah, I have the bias turned down so it doesn't overheat. So it may not sound that great, but here's a sample. Into the shore if I only could. Call out your name and take your I'll put the box in differentiation mode so you can hear the difference. Okay, I'll put it back into sum mode. You can see how it uh, takes the vocals out. You can kind of hear the ambience of the vocals. It's just how they happen to mix this. But you can hear some really neat effects with some music. But anyhow, as far as this amplifier goes, it seems to be working so far. Like I say, I'm going to get it on the little aluminum heat spreader, put it on a heat sink, crank up the voltage, put some loads on it, do some tests. See what this thing can do. See if I have to do any modifications to it. So I cut me some aluminum. Drilled, tapped, and deburred the holes. Cut me some screws down to size. Got me a piece of mica for the uh, heat sink isolator, wherever that went. And we got us a snicker here, up here on the bench. Hi, Sig! Yeah! going on you haven't been in my videos lately you've been kind of lazy well here's the snick gotta get back to work snick big yawn for you a big toothy yawn okay bias stability I have an amplifier it's set at 60 milliamps the actual output current is like 31 this measurement here is probably rounded up because the meter on the supply doesn't go that low. Plus the other parts of the circuit are using some current. So what I'm going to do is play a 40 hertz tone here. Get this amplifier warmed up a little bit. And you can see the current drops back down. It's falling back in line to what it was. I mean, there is some thermal resistance. The heat's got to get out of these transistors and over to this. But that's a good sign. The amplifier is not thermally running away. It the current drops back down. 
So yeah, that's looking good so far as far as bias stability goes. The one thing I don't like is this control. I have it turned all the way down. If I go the other way, then the bias goes way up. So what I'm going to have to do is change this resistor right here to another value. Try another value. See, uh, this kind of limits the range. So you can't turn the bias up too high, but the problem is uh, I'm limited on the low end. So I'll have to uh, experiment and adjust that resistor for the final um, schematic of the amplifier. And, yep, the bias fell all the way back down to what it should be. Hey, hey! Hey, hey! <laughs> okay, so I have the amp clampulated onto this heat sink. I have this 100 watt 8 ohm load connected to the output. One of these days I'll build a proper load with a heat sink and switches and all that good stuff. We have the supervisor who's not paying attention at the moment. Yeah, uh, the uh, power supply is plus or minus 28 volts. Amplifier is just sitting idle. And, uh, well, I'll put the signal in and have the preamp set up. Point you at the heat sink here and we'll see what kind of power this thing does. Okay, well, just this. There's clipping. It's nice and symmetrical. And you know another thing? This thing does not oscillate. There's no weird things going on with the clipping, like little oscillations. This amp is looking stable, but the step response tests will uh, prove that, I guess. Okay, let me uh, get this to where all the clipping is gone. And uh, camera's in the way. So we have, what is that, 18.2 volts RMS. So we'll turn that off so things don't get too roasty toasty. So 18.2, square that, and divided by 8. So we're getting 41.4 watts into 8 ohm loads. So yeah, we're doing a little better than uh, 35 watts, which is okay. Okay, so now I have the 4 ohm non-inductive resistors connected. Let's see what kind of power we get. Clipping is still symmetrical, which is nice to see. Tells me we're delivering enough current. And uh, what do we got there? 17.0 volts. So 17.0 squared divided by 4 ohms is 72.25 watts. Well, that's way more than expected. So bias has fallen back to what it was. It does climb a little bit from when the amp's completely cold. You know, it falls back. It doesn't thermally run away. Okay, so now I'll do a distortion test. I'll just use the 4 ohm load. And uh, this is preliminary. I'll have to hook this up to my computer and run a bunch of other tests. I'll say that for the next video, but I would just want to see what this thing will do. Okay, it's clipping. We'll dial that back. So it's pretty clean. I don't really see any fixed nodes. This is the pilot signal I always mention. That's part of the input signal. That's at 1% of the fundamental. That just allows me to compare any nodes that I see to see how much distortion I have. And, well, it's a pretty clean amplifier. Okay, so that's going to wrap it up with part one. In part two, I'll do the step response tests where I put capacitive loads across the output and you know, check the stability of the amplifier, make sure it's going to be unconditionally stable. Might try some power tests at 25 volts, plus or minus 25 volts. See if we can, uh, we'll probably still get close to our numbers. A couple things I need to adjust with the amplifier. Um, 
I'm not sure if I'll do it, but I might adjust this resistor in the biasing network because I'm pretty much at the end of travel of this trimmer for adjusting the bias. But there's still a bit of room, so I don't know if I will or not. Another thing is output offset voltage. I didn't measure it on camera, but it has about 90 millivolts. And that's my fault because I gotta find the schematic here. I don't have a 750 ohm resistor and I used a different value here and it does affect the output offset. So yeah, it should be a lot better than that. I'll have to see if I can get a proper resistor for that. Well, that's going to do it for part one. Snickers snoozing on the job. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks for watching. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and make a second video. I have to do all the tests. I have to do the step response. Oh, wait a minute. Cut this part.